The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between an international student and the accommodation department. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 3. Hello, Accommodation Department. How can I help you? Uh, do you look after accommodation for international students? Yes, uh, we look after accommodation for all the students. Good. I hope you can help me then. I've only just been accepted onto a postgraduate course and I want to know if there is any accommodation available from this September. I know it's very short notice. Mm, yes, uh, it, it is rather late, but I'm sure we'll be able to find you something. Uh, first of all, can you give me your name and student number so that I can find you on the system? Sure. My name is Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Uh, how do you spell that? G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z. Thank you. Got it. And your student number, please? S-H-U-3-0-0-7-1-5-1. S-H-U-3-0-0-7-1-5-P-G. P-G. Ah, here you are. Department of Modern Languages. Yes, that's me. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 4 to 7. Okay, now there are several options for postgraduate students. Firstly, there is the Trigon. Uh, this is a new block near to the station and not far from the main campus. Accommodation is what we call cluster accommodation. What does that mean? Uh, there's a small group of rooms, usually six, each with its own bathroom clustered around a lounge kitchen area which is shared. Oh, I see. That sounds good. They are very popular. Uh, the price for these is £99 per week, and we do have some availability left. However, for postgraduate students, there are other options. And what are they? Uh, there's another apartment block called The Cube, located near the west gate of the campus. Accommodation there is in one or two bedroom self-contained flats. So, The Cube is self-contained? How does that work? Well, basically, they're just like ordinary apartments. Each apartment has one or two study bedrooms with ensuite bathroom, a lounge and a kitchen. And what is the price of those? Uh, for the one bedroom, it is £180 per week. And for the two bedroom, it is £110 per week for each person. And can I choose who I share with? If you have a friend and you would like to share with them, of course, we can reserve a two-bedroom apartment for you both. Otherwise, you just have to share with whoever else is there. Uh, obviously, it will be another woman. Hmm. I will have to think about this. Do I have to make a decision now? No, but we don't have much accommodation left, so I can't guarantee that there will still be availability if you leave it too long. Yes, that's fair. I have a friend in the management department who might like to share. I will speak with her and get back to you this afternoon. OK, fine. Uh, do let us know as soon as you can. I will do. Thanks for all your help. My pleasure. Bye. Bye.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a tutor and two students discussing modern European writers. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. OK, so to continue our look at modern European writers who have focused on the future in their work, today we're talking about H.G. Wells. Last week, I asked you both to do some background research on Wells, which we're going to discuss now. Gitanjali, tell us about H.G. Wells. Right. So, H.G. Wells was a hugely successful British science fiction writer. Writing at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, and much of his work focused on predicting the future. Jason, do you think Wells was just using the future as a narrative device in his fiction? No, no. He really believed we can predict the future. In fact, he gave a speech at the Royal Institution in London in 1902 called The Discovery of the Future, and the point he was making was that by looking at what you know about the present and about science, it's quite possible to predict the future. Indeed. Gitanjali, do you think Wells was always optimistic in his predictions? Not at all. In fact, he varied in his predictions from being extremely pessimistic about the future to being optimistic. Interestingly, one theory I read links the attitude in Wells's work to his own health. When he was writing The Time Machine, which was published in 1895, he'd just been diagnosed with an incurable fatal disease. Not surprisingly, the book is very pessimistic. Being about a dystopia in the future, a long time in the future, the year 802-701, in fact, where there are two races on Earth, the Morlocks and the Eloi, and the Morlocks actually eat the Eloi. I thought it was interesting, though, that it was H.G. Wells who actually came up with the phrase time machine. So despite being pessimistic, the work has had a lasting effect on our culture. Right. After the time machine, though, H.G. Wells didn't die, of course. And his recovery might be why he began to be a bit more optimistic about the future. So that brings us to his first utopia, Anticipations. Jason, tell us about that. Well, Anticipations, or to give it its full title, Anticipations of the Reaction of the Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Scientific Thought, was published in 1901 and was set in the New Republic of the year 2000. Some of the things Wells predicts are fairly close to our reality today, including 24-hour news, global telecommunications, and even a European Union. We'll come back to the accuracy of Wells's predictions a little later. Gitanjali, how was Wells' work received at the time? Well, although Wells was extremely successful, not everyone respected his work or his predictions. Another well-known science fiction writer, Jules Verne, viciously attacked him for works, such as The First Man in the Moon, which Verne argued weren't rooted in scientific fact at all. That's right. 
Now, Wells wrote a number of other utopian visions of the future. Jason? Yes. In a modern utopia, published in 1905, his vision was of a world where there's no private property, where everyone has access to wonderful health care, and interestingly, where everyone's personal information is stored on cards in a central database outside Paris. Apart from the health care, I'm not sure everyone today would see that as a positive view of the future. Neither am I. And, on a similar note, Wells strongly believed in population control and in the shape of things to come, which was published in 1933, he sees and supports a world where the population is kept at 2 billion. Once again, I'm not sure most people today would necessarily see that as a good thing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Gitanjali, in your research, did you come across anything about the world brain? Yes, I did. It's actually very interesting. Throughout the 1930s, Wells predicted and supported the setting up of a huge world encyclopedia. And towards the end of the decade, in 1938, he wrote a series of essays called World Brain. In these essays, he called for the world to make use of modern technology to create an enormous global encyclopedia so that all our knowledge is available to all people, not just an educated elite. Wells envisioned this as probably being on microfilm. He thought it would allow anyone, anywhere in the world, to look at any book or any document. He also thought it would be created by everyone, once again not just by an elite. Yes, and as you can imagine, many people today say that the Internet has basically fulfilled his prediction. Of course, it doesn't use microfilm, but essentially, it does meet all Wells's main requirements. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with Professor Green from a local university which enrolls a large number of overseas students in its courses. He is talking to Indra, a student representative about the importance of attending lectures. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good afternoon, Professor Green. Thank you for your time today. I wonder if you could explain why you think it is important for us to attend lectures in a course that we are studying. 
Well, despite the increasing dependence on online communication these days, I do think it is important. Apart from delivering the content of the lecture itself, I believe that there are some general communication benefits from having large groups of students together in one place. For lecturers, it is an opportunity for us to address many students together at one time. For students, it helps you to feel part of the wider learning community who are following the course. You can interact with each other both before and after the lecture to discuss the ideas and content, networking with each other and comparing your notes. But isn't most of this achieved, as you said, these days through online communication? Well, lecturers do communicate with students online, of course, but we usually only give a summary or notes of the lecture. So there are significant differences. When you go to lectures, you get more of an insight into what the lecturer considers important. We give additional commentary and anecdotes, and by voice emphasis, we can alert you to the key concepts, theories and issues of the subject. By not attending lectures, you might miss crucial information about what we are expecting in an assignment. You know, these extra things can make a difference. OK, but there are tutorials. There is a lot of interaction between students and lecturers in tutorials. Can't all this be done in tutorial discussion groups instead of having lectures? Yes, to some extent. But during lectures, the lecturers can sensitise you to the debates and the controversies that are dealt with in the literature. This can help you think more critically about the subject. So then, when you come to the tutorial, you'll be able to come with some questions and ideas for discussion. The result of this is that the tutorial class will be more beneficial for everyone who attends. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I see your point. However, surely this also depends on whether students are able to understand and follow the lecture well. What strategies do you recommend to help students get the most out of lectures? I would say that first of all, it is important to do some pre-reading. By doing this, you get an orientation to the topic. You'll become familiar with the key terms and you'll be able to follow the lecture points more easily. I also think it is good to arrive early to collect handouts and to find a seat where it is easy to see and hear what is going on. Then, importantly, during the lecture itself, you need to be attentive. I know from experience that it is often difficult to be attentive. What can students do to improve their attentiveness during the lecture? I think that there are two keys to following a lecture successfully, using the visual cues and using active listening techniques. By maintaining eye contact with the lecturer and following how the lecturer makes use of the slides, whiteboard and so on, you are using the lecturer's visual cues which help make the structure of the information clear and give you a sense of what's important. Then, using active listing techniques will also help you to process the information. What do you mean by active listening techniques? Well, you need to pay attention to the methods the lecturer uses to highlight important information. As I said before, in the spoken language of a lecture, we get the benefit of things such as stress and intonation, use of examples and anecdotes, as well as the language signals used to show relationships between ideas. Yes, I see what you mean. These things will be missing in written summaries. And what about taking notes? Does that help? Taking notes helps you to concentrate, so I would certainly advise you to do that. It's difficult to listen and write good notes at the same time, so it does take some training. 
Yes, taking notes needs a lot of practice, I've found. Do you have any other advice? Well, I can't finish without stressing the importance of formulating questions while you are listening. During the lecture, you should ask yourself questions about the content of the lecture and the points you are following. Ask questions like, what are the benefits or problems? What other examples are there? How does it work? Why does this happen? This will keep you focused and actively engaged in the content of the lecture. Professor Green, thank you very much for your valuable tips and your time today. You are very welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture given by a tour agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to Hawaii Tour Agency. Let me tell you a little about a special package we have going on this week. I know everybody wants to get away from the stress of work and life, so I think you should all consider a week-long vacation to the paradise of Hawaii. First off, let me tell you all a little bit about Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands are of volcanic origin and are edged with coral reefs. Because of its volcanic origins, people often go especially to see the volcanoes. Hawaii is the largest and geologically the youngest island of the group. Oahu is the most populous and economically important. The capital of Honolulu is located on the island of Oahu, the only U.S. state in the tropics. Hawaii is sometimes called the Paradise of the Pacific because of its spectacular beauty, abundant sunshine, Expanses of lush green plants and beautiful colored flowers, palm trees, coral beaches with rolling white surf, and cloud-covered volcanic peaks rising to majestic heights. Some of the world's largest active and inactive volcanoes are found on Hawaii and Maui. Eruptions of the active volcanoes have provided spectacular displays, but their lava flows have occasionally caused great property damage. The lava can spill down the mountains, into the settlements where people live. The most famous of these is right by Honolulu. It is called Diamond Head because from far away, the top of the volcano looks like a diamond. Vegetation is generally luxuriant throughout the islands with giant fern forests and lush vegetation. Although many species of birds and domestic animals have been introduced on the islands, there are few wild animals other than boars and goats, and there are no snakes. The coastal waters abound with fish. More ethnic and cultural groups are represented in Hawaii than in any other state. Chinese laborers who came to work in the sugar industry were the first of the large groups of immigrants to arrive, starting in 1852, and Filipinos and Koreans were the last, after 1900. Other immigrant groups, including Portuguese, Germans, Japanese, and Puerto Ricans, came in the latter part of the 19th century. Intermarriage with other races has brought a further decrease in the number of pure-blooded Hawaiians who comprise a very small percentage of the population. Now all of this sounds very interesting, right? For only $600 per person, we are offering a tour package to Hawaii. This includes your round-trip airfare and fully guided tours. The duration of the trip is five days, including hotel for five nights and tour buses that will take you all around. 
We will go to the famous beaches, the volcanoes, and the forests. Sign up today to save your space, as seats are running out quickly. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.